welcome to another Nonsense Wars miscellaneous engineering thing. This time we're going to go over some air engines I built. Um, we had a lot of trouble trying to get the regular oscillating piston design working, uh, which is where this came from. This is a well, an oscillating regular linear piston. This is an oscillating piston. So um, instead of a piston sliding straight in a tube, it's actually hinged and the flap opens and closes. You can kind of see what it's doing here, like this. Uh, and so this way, it, it's just a lot easier to get something that moves smoothly in an arc and seals. So the sides are sealed here, the end is sealed by those uh, cheese slopes, and this side's hinge is pretty much blocked off just by having a bunch of axle and pin joiners. Um, so that's how that works. Um, that the end of the piston, so the piston is just a big panel, uh, goes up and down to this crank, which drives a flywheel, and then also drives this valve. So the way the valve works is um, this little crank tips that rocker through a bell crank, which pulls this lever. So this just sits by gravity normally until, uh, the, pist oop, until the piston goes by and tips it up. Uh, and what's in here is just a, uh, this is attached to a flappy plate, uh, which you can't see, I'll show you on a different engine, um, that just covers the throat of this connector. Um, and if you've never seen this part before, that's because it only came in this this one set, the aero tube hanger. Um, it's the connectors that go with these pipes. And the reason we've got one of those is to make it easier to attach the uh, air engines to a vacuum cleaner. Uh, what we did was you can plug the tube on one side and then the other end we had this big plate and the vacuums normal pipe connector plugs against this. You'll see this later in the video. Uh, and that forms a nice seal, and then you can run the air engine off of that. Okay, so after the first uh, one-cylinder uh, oscillating piston engine, uh, I decided to do a two-cylinder version um, to try to smooth out the torque a little. Of course, I wanted to make the whole thing a little smaller, too, so it wasn't so huge, but that meant that the engine's probably a little weaker overall. Um, so taking a look here, you can see there's a white half which is for one piston and a red half for the other piston. Uh, spinning that flywheel, you can see them sweeping up and down. So you can kind of see where the airflow goes, it, the vacuum flow goes. It gets sucked through here. This manifold splits it to the left and right and there's a valve. There's a valve on each side for each piston. Uh, and you can see the valves kick out there. And then this uh, piston itself seals against the wall using that cheese slope goes up and down with a crank like that. This one, I wanted to mess around a little with uh, the ability to change the valve timing because I wasn't sure what was actually correct. It turns out 180 degrees is about right. Uh, but to change the valve timing on this, you can pull this brick and just crack the entire engine in half. And actually, this is a good way to see what's going on in here. So the piston side's just hinged back here. This eight length axle goes all the way through and is actually the bearing for both pistons. Um, so up and down like that and then on the distributor side you can see barely in there some arches one by four arch bricks those get covered up by this uh, these lift arms in the down position and in the up position the vacuum can flow around and each port goes to one piston uh, so this crank is just keeps them 180 degrees out of phase put the engine back together here and I made a mark on the gears earlier. Which side is it? This side. I know which way it went together, and then I can run the engine again.
So, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the first engine that I went with this, uh, this oscillating piston because of troubles we had. Most of the time when people think of a piston or they do an air engine, it's a cylinder like this, which is square, and a piston, which is also square, and it fits in like that, and you know, you would expect it to go up and down like this, but people have you know, an oscillating piston design, so this needs to tilt back and forth, which means this can't rock around, which means you add more bricks and then keep it from rocking around but it's still pushing against the side of it and there's a lot of friction and then the bricks wear each other out anyway i mean this is a problem that james watt solved in the beginning for the steam engine how to make this go up and down without any reinforcement and then if you don't tilt the cylinder either and use a different valve then this is really good you can go up and down really smoothly so that's what we did here on the third engine so this uses the James Watt parallel motion, uh, which is basically there's a Watt linkage, which is formed by the yellow beam, this gray crank. And you can see there's a couple of black lift arms there. Um, that makes this part go up and down in a straight line, and the rest of the linkage doubles the distance of travel. So that goes straight down into this piston, which you can see is just, it's just a 4x4 plate with something to hold that studless beam straight up and it goes straight up and down inside there the other end is just a normal crank goes down and turns this crank on a flywheel other side of the crank goes to this cam which when it reaches here pushes on this arm which pushes goes all the way there pushes on this arm that opens the valve it's the same design of valve that we used earlier See, it's just a axle that goes through, and this plate, when it's shut, seals against this, and I mean, there's a little blow-by, but it's good enough. Vacuum engines are all leaky. So this, there's a little arched gap there to let the vacuum into the piston, and then this goes on here. So this engine actually, because of the parallel motion, which gives a near straight line travel, is pretty smooth running and I felt pretty confident just adding the flywheel directly on the crankshaft without any gearing up. One of the measures people talk about when they talk about how powerful engine, an engine is, is displacement. And the reason that correlates to the strength of an engine is, imagine you have a constant vacuum pressure here, so we had like one and a half psi, basically. Well, that applied over this area of the piston is the force, and then the force traveling through a distance is the, is work done, and then how fast the piston does that gives you the power. Uh, so you can sort of predict the relative powers of the engine by looking at their displacement, which isn't the total volume available in the cylinder or the chamber, but rather the area swept out by the piston itself. So you can see here at the top of the travel, it's about there. And then the bottom of the travel, it's about there. So it's probably about 10 degrees hinged here by, you know, eight studs. Um, and so that sort of pi slice times the width of the piston is the displacement here. And from that, you can kind of predict how powerful the engine's gonna be for the same input vacuum. So this engine, right, has the crank throw is shorter because it's on these 24 tooth gears rather than a, uh, a lift arm. And the pistons are shorter in length too. So even though they move through maybe the same angle, the total area covered by each piston is a lot smaller. And I mean, there's two of them, but the area is a lot smaller. So you'd expect this engine to be less powerful. And then this one, it's four by four studs. And then it goes all the way up and down through like, you know, two studs of travel. So that's quite a bit of volume on each stroke. So that may be why this engine's quite a bit more powerful than the other two.
the rest of this video shows some calculations uh, leading to the estimated power of the beam engine. In order to do this math, we needed to measure the pressure applied at the input. Uh, we did this by pulling up on a scale with the vacuum and dividing the weight differential by the area of the hose. This figure, uh, about 1.5 psi, may not be that accurate, but it should be enough to give us a ballpark figure. So I basically want to try to figure out roughly how much uh, how much airflow these these engines are consuming. So it's probably going to be easiest to do this math for the linear one, which is like this. Um, so this piston, you basically need to con we need to figure out what the displacement per stroke is or per revolution is. Uh, and so let's assume for the time being that the valve is open for the entire duration of a downstroke. So the area here is four studs, x four studs. Uh, one stud is eight millimeters. One over two. 25.4 to get inches, so 2.51. Right, can you see this? All right, cool. So anyway, it's four studs by four studs. So the and then the total travel is like eight stud, like two studs of here. So let's assume it's two studs. So four times four times two. That's 32 studs cubed is the displacement. Um, but a um, a stud is, so 32 studs cubed times one stud, oh, eight millimeters per stud, and uh, 25.4 millimeters per inch. So that needs to be cubed too, and that's going to be 32 times eight divided by 25.4, and cubed. So this is pretty much one cubic inch, exactly, displacement. Which means, um, now this engine did about 700 RPM, which means we're getting 700 cube per minute. And people usually do feet per minute, so we need to divide this by 12 three times. So 700 divided by 12 and cubed. So that means we're getting about 0.41 cubic feet per minute through this engine. I don't know if that's the maximum the vacuum can put out. Probably not because there's leaking air around the edge of it. And plus when the valve is closed, the vacuum is still running. So the vacuum could probably put out way more than this but this is the effective airflow through the engine. So the next question is basically, what's the power we're getting out of this motor? So um, we're gonna do this one in metric because those are a little less miserable. Um, so back to the total travel, we had 32 studs cubed, right? So now we're gonna multiply that by, um, by, we're gonna do this to meters. So 0 0.008 meters, a uh, whole thing cubed. Um, per stud. So 32 times 0 0.008. That thing cubed is 1.6384 times 10 to the negative 5 meters cubed. So this is the displacement of the engine, which uh, now we need to take that times times per minute. And then we also need the PSI, so, or the, the, the pressure. So we're gonna basically trying to get, um, we have about 1.5, was it the right number? PSI, and vert, 35. So that's 10.34 kilopascals. That sounds about right, a pascal's a really tiny unit. Okay, so. Now that's um, 10.34 newtons per meter squared. 
All right, so now we can say we have 10.34 newtons per meter squared times 1.6384 times 10 to the negative 5, 1 over meter, cu uh, meter cubed. So this will give us the work done per, uh, per power stroke. And then we need to get a power out of that. So we have 700 RPMs, so revolutions per minute, um, times 700 per minute, times minute over 60 seconds. So let's see what that is. So that times 1.6384 to the negative 5 times 700 divided by 60. Hmm, that doesn't seem right for some reason. Oh, that's kilopascals, so we need to go to the 100, the 1,000. So, so, kilonewtons right there. So that's 1.9, uh, seven, seven watts is the total power from this. So 